We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is John Titus, creator of the Best Evidence YouTube channel and Substack, and the co-host of a weekly podcast with Catherine Austin Fitz over at Solari.com. How are you today, John? I'm great, Tom. I should also mention I, I have a mirror channel at BitChute and Odyssey, and then another channel at Rumble. Some people get really exercised if you just leave it at YouTube. Yeah, I know. I know we've had some uh, some challenges with YouTube, um, and to be able to to put our content other places where it can get viewed and uh, hopefully um, not not shadow striked is uh, is valuable, right? Yes, very much so. Yes, especially when we're we're touching on the subjects that uh, you know we're going to touch on today. Yeah, you're being watched, Tom. I'm sure you know that. <laughs> well, as as is everybody, so I guess that makes yeah. the playing field somewhat leveled, right? I, I feel so much better, <laughs> John. I wanted to uh, to talk to you because one of our listeners actually reached out and pointed out your channel. You know, going through your content, I, I think what you do is is really excellent. You take a a deep dive into a lot of Fed data, a lot of the 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 data, you know, in and around the the financial markets, and really the the, the debt situation, the banking situation, all of this. And and you actually predicted the banking crisis in January before almost anybody else was even talking about it. So. I'd like to start by asking what you were watching to kind of come to that conclusion at that time. Well, you know, I knew the interest rates rising was going to create, it was going to devalue anything, any asset like a loan that had been lent out at say, zero or 1% interest rate. You know, once the interest rates go up, that loan paper, those IOU papers are worth less, but that's really just a solvency issue. The the real tip off to me that there was a liquidity issue. A liquidity issue is a much more serious problem when you can't pay your bills on time. The, the, the tip off that there was a liquidity problem was what I call the panic borrowing from the federal home loan boards, the FHLB. And if you look, go back onto the Fed website, the FRED, uh, Federal Reserve Economic Data, it's, it's hosted by the St. Louis Federal Reserve. They have a 822,000 graphs. And you look at federal home loan board bank, you know, borrowing by the banking industry over time, what you'll see is that when you see spikes up in FHLB borrowing by banks, that's a guaranteed sign that there's there's a crisis afoot. And that's what I was seeing on the Fed on the Fed graphs. The problem with the with the Fred data on FHLB borrowing is it's quarterly, so it's a little bit slow, but it doesn't really matter because um, it's a it's a surefire tell, and that was what that's what tipped me off. So I put a video out called "Why Is the Federal Reserve Provoking a Financial Crisis?" That came out February fifteenth, and then three weeks later, Silicon Valley Bank went down. I mean that that part I got lucky on the timing being that tight within three weeks, mm -hmm. but I knew it was coming. Just a matter of when. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, we've seen this before, where you know, let's say in twenty nineteen with the with the repo crisis. Um, you know, are there parallels to other times in history when when this has started and kind of precipitated a, a bigger crisis than, you know, a handful of of regional banks, which uh, we'll, we'll get to as well? Um, in, in one sense, yeah, there, there are parallels because when banks get in trouble, they have they do certain things. Um, they panic borrow and they try to to meet their obligations, and that's what was going on here. So you'd see parallels. In 2008, there was panic borrowing then. There was panic borrowing, like you mentioned, in the repo crisis. But that was really, that that was a sort of a flashpoint. It was so fast that on a quarterly basis, it looks like it's, you know, neck and neck. There's no real advance warning. Mm -hmm. um, but in some sense, it's unprecedented what's happened. Because what the Fed has done, well, first of all, the Fed's balance sheet, you know, for 100 years, 95 years, whatever, up until 2008, it was less than a trillion dollars. And the Fed was just using its balance sheet really to do two things, to back Federal Reserve notes, that, that was the, most of the balance sheet, 
And then there was a certain amount of reserve balances on, on account for banks just to enable banks to settle transactions between themselves and between their customers. And that was it. But in 2008, that was unprecedented. The Fed creating reserves out of thin air to buy trillions of dollars of assets. So you saw the balance sheet explode from, say, $900 billion to two, two and a half, you know, three trillion dollars. And then so that was unprecedented. But even then, that's different than what's going on now. Back then, in the global financial crisis of 08, 09, what the Fed was doing was it was creating new reserves to buy assets from banks. And that's a key difference because when the Fed buys you know, assets from banks, it's a two-party transaction. You know, those, those two parties, they transact in reserves and assets. Those are the only two things that change hands. What happened in 2020 with, you know, pandemic is that the Fed was creating new reserves far larger in scale, number one. But the real difference in 2020 was the Fed was now buying assets not from banks, but from non-banks. And non-banks, as you know, do not have accounts at the Fed. You don't have an account at the Fed. I don't have an account at the Fed. And so we need third party, you know, we need an intermediary in a transaction involving the Fed as a buyer of our assets. And so that's what really drove up retail deposits. And that is wholly unprecedented. It had never happened before until 2020. So I mean, it never happened. It never happened. Let me, let me restate that. It never happened in the volume that it happened. The Fed had bought assets from non-banks, but not in the volume that we're talking about, four and a half trillion dollars. That was that was just crazy. Mm -hmm. So is it all banks that have an account at the Fed or is it, you know, the, the commercial banks, the, the, the bigger banks that that have that? Well, even if they don't have an account, like say a credit union doesn't have an account at the Fed, mm -hmm. they'll have a sponsor bank and they can work through that. But the, the, pretty much any bank of size is going to have an account at the Fed. There's two different types of account, as, as I understand it. You got to understand, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a financial guy. Mm -hmm. I have to, what I know, I know by reading a lot of papers and a lot of books and whatnot. And it's a slog because there's a lot of misinformation out there. But there basically, there's the two kinds of accounts. They're just your garden variety reserve account and then a transaction account. I don't really, I'm not going to pretend to know the difference. But every bank, one way or another, has an account at the Fed either directly by having you know its name on an account at the Fed or indirectly through a sponsor bank. Whereas you and I don't have any account at the Fed, direct or indirect, we have to go through a third party. Mm -hmm. We don't have a proxy for us at the Fed. So John, when when we're thinking about let's say the, the difference this time after after the pandemic, the the way that the Fed reacted is the the mechanisms that they used, and as you're as you're saying, the, that difference did that create the inflation that we we've ended up seeing? Yes, there's no there's no question about that. Um, when the pan, let's just go to one minute before the pandemic began, and one minute before the Fed was buying assets, that started. Its announcement was made on March 15, 2020. At that point, if you if you added up all the deposits and banks in the U.S. $13.5 trillion. That's what it was sitting at. When it was said and done a year or so later, after the Fed had and it front loaded those purchases, the asset purchases, when it was all said and done, the balance sheet had gone from $13.5 trillion at, at retail banks to $18 trillion on account at, at, at retail banks, at commercial banks. And that's where your inflation came from. And I'm not alone in saying that. Uh, I did a video. I, I think it's called Toilet Flushing the U.S. in Three Vibrant Colors or some such thing. And there's a clip in there I have of Mervyn King, who was the governor of the Bank of England between 2003 and 2013, so during the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And Mervyn King throws the Fed under the bus. And he says, yeah, of course they have inflation. They increased the money supply for, for households and ordinary businesses. And that's the key. In other words, it wasn't he's saying, that, yeah, they increased the money supply, but they didn't do it like they did it in 2008 and 2009. It wasn't just reserve balances on account with the Fed. They increased, they massively increased, the Fed did, accounts of ordinary businesses and households. And so he, and he says, and that's why they have inflation. Mm -hmm. He says it's 25%. In fact, the increase in the money supply, that, that retail checking deposit, those the deposit accounts at commercial banks, the, the real number went up is more like 35%. And that's for sure. 
where your inflation is coming from. There's no doubt about that. Because mm -hmm. that creates, you know, more currency to chase the same amount of goods, let's say, right? Ding. And that's separate and apart from the fact that currency and circulation, Federal Reserve notes also went up. If you actually look at a chart of currency and circulation, there's a, there's, it, you know, it's linear until you get to 2020. And then it, it, it noticeably, there's a lump there too. It's just not the spike through the ceiling that the retail bank accounts are. Mm -hmm. So how did, how did this pandemic uh, quantitative easing really contribute to the banking crisis? Well, that's a good question. It took me a long time to track that down. But I was going through Senate testimony and Senate hearings on Silicon Valley bank failure. And what jumps out to me, there's a clip, and I have it in my video called Deep Diving the Fed's Killer Whale Crisis. There's a clip of, of Mark Warner, senator from Virginia, who used to be a venture capitalist. And he says, well, you know, Silicon, he, almost in passing, he says, well, Silicon Valley Bank had, you know, 13 billion dollars on accounts spread across 10 accounts. And it's like, what? You know, and then I started because let me back up. When the Fed bought four and a half trillion dollars of assets uh, from non-banks, you know, I, I, I knew that at that time the Fed was doing that. It was buying those assets through companies like BlackRock, OK, which is a non-bank financial institution. And that's where I figured that. I, so I knew there was four and a half trillion dollars of new deposit money on account in the U.S., but I kind of assumed that it was sitting in the, in the accounts of businesses and of municipalities and of governments. But then I start watching this testimony in the Senate. It's like, wait a minute. A lot of that money is mm -hmm. got to be in household accounts because you can't, you know, for a big company, and I speak as a lawyer, I'm, I litigate patents. I, I've done a lot of corporate litigation. When a company cuts a massive check, like $100 million or a billion dollars or the amount of money we're talking about, to sink a bank in a few hours, the company can't just do that, okay? This, because companies, they have to have protocols and they have rules and they have processes that they have to go through. They can't just snap their fingers and make things happen, mm -hmm. okay? Households can do that. People can do that because who's the, there's, there are no corporate requirements on a person. There's no really legal requirements. I mean, what's to stop you from checking your astrology chart if you've got the money and writing a billion dollar check because you're afraid of this or that, nothing. So I knew that some of, a lot of that money had to be in household accounts. And when I went and checked the wealth bands, the, one of the things the Fed tracks is checkable deposits of households by wealth band. And it divides up into five wealth bands. The top one they check is the point is the top 0.1%. And that's a good starting place because the top 1% is the top 0.1% is one household in a thousand. And when I looked at the graph, I'll show it to you right here. This is an astonishing graph. I mean, look at that increase. This is average check checking account, checkable deposit at a, at a top 0.1% household. Before the pandemic, you can see there it's $565,000. And then after, you know, once the Fed, it's all said and done, the average household account then is five five million dollars. And that's that's a breathtaking number. That's a breathtaking graph. That's a huge increase. So I realized somewhere along the line, the money had to have gone, the new asset money, the asset purchases had to have gotten somehow, some way. It got from the accounts of people like BlackRock and into household accounts. And the graphs bore that out. The graphs totally bear that out. I've got graph after graph after graph that I walk through and I show that, that yeah, the money started out in, a, in business accounts, and in legal entity accounts and nonprofits, whoever, but it ends up in it ends up in household accounts because the other graph, the, if you if you look at the graph generally of all accounts in the U.S., you know it, it it goes up and it stays up, but the business accounts and those accounts they spike up, but then they revert to their mean pretty quickly, mm -hmm. meaning that money got passed from businesses like Black Rock, Rock to households, and that's that's a huge huge. Uh, that's a lot of money sloshing around from businesses to households. And that's what enabled that crisis to take place, in my opinion. And the testimony bears that out. I mean, $42 billion left Silicon Valley Bank in the space of six hours. I mean, the media is sitting there saying, that's people on apps. And I'm like, that ain't people on apps. That's whales in the banking system writing $1 billion checks 
in wiring it out in one day. That's what happened there. And the testimony completely bears that out. Well, John, you know, I think, you know, as you present in that video, that is in in a lot of ways, the, the real story of this banking crisis is the size of some of these accounts that were in the millions yeah. and, and billions of dollars in size. So, you know, why would they expose themselves to that much deposit risk as the FDIC insurance only covers 250000 and that money wasn't getting a great interest rate versus even holding treasuries, let's say. So, you know, do you have any explanation as to why some of these depositors chose to keep their money and especially that much money in, in one bank? Either they didn't have any other options, which they did. Or they chose to for whatever reason. And the question is, well, why did you choose to leave your money exposed like that? I have no unique insight on that. Mm -hmm. But to me, it just looks like a takedown. I mean, what else? There's no, why would somebody leave these graphs? When you look at these graphs, when you look at that household graph of money going up, it stays up, it goes up and it stays up for mm -hmm. a couple of years. It's sitting there. I mean, I could see somebody having a billion dollar account at a bank for a day maybe for a week, for whatever reason, for you need to facilitate to get the other ducks in a row and before you transfer the money into something that can't, that can't have a total loss, a loss of all but $250,000. Yeah, a day or a week makes sense, but three years, you know. And then when you find out, oh, it was a handful of people and that came out of the testimony too. Came out with Warner was talking in the Senate and he says, yeah, well, you know, my understanding is that a lot of these VCs they order, you know, all their accounts to be drained at once, all their companies to be, to be drained at once. This is this is a plan. Yeah, you know, it was it was a hit, and that's the only explanation I have. And that's not a great explanation. I mean, that's kind of a wild-eyed, crazy idea. Mm -hmm. But it beats the explanation of well, these guys are just idiots, and they left a billion dollars completely exposed in an alleyway dice game for three years. That didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys, these are smart guys. Smart people don't leave. A billion dollars of asset exposed to total loss should a commercial bank go down. That doesn't. That story is not going to fly. You need another one because that one sucks. You know, you you mentioned another one of the narratives that we heard uh, during the banking crisis, and that was that apps were the cause of, you know, a lot of this these withdrawals. So. Was that, you know, the the one of the biggest reasons or, or problems within that banking crisis. But certainly one of the biggest patsies, but I don't think so because again, the testimony in the Senate is that it, the amount of money that went out of Silicon Valley Bank was $42 billion in six hours, some such amount. You know, six hours is a long time. You don't need an app to transfer your money in six hours. You need an app to transfer your money in a minute, but not in six hours. In six hours, you could do what people did in 1929 to be quite blunt about it and call up the bank president and say, listen, you're going to transfer my money out or bad things are going to happen to you by the close of the business, my man. So get it out now. That, you know, six hours is, is, a, is a long time. That That's an infinity when it comes to electronic stuff. Apps did not enable this crisis, mm -hmm. right? That, that's, that, that, I mean, they might have added to it. They might have exacerbated a little bit, but it doesn't really matter. When you've got, when you've got $13 billion sitting in 10 accounts, apps had nothing to do with that. It's the fact that you've got a billion dollars completely uninsured sitting in an account for three years. That's your story, not apps. Yeah. Apps is, that's just a complete Batsy story to me. You know, one of the, one of the other things that I was picking up on um, as, as I was watching your video was that, you know, it's being called a regional banking crisis. Is this really misleading? Yeah, <laughs> it's totally misleading um, because the banks that have failed Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and First Republic Bank, you know, in terms of assets, the size of their assets, those banks rank in, in order 17, 15, and 32. They're the biggest banks in the country. There's only 34 banks in the U.S. with assets north of $100 billion, and all three of those banks have assets north of $100 billion. So if you think about that, there's 4,700 banks in the U.S., Okay. The odds that a given bank, in other words, would be in the top 47 are less than one in 100. We've got three in the top 47. We got three in the top 32, mm -hmm. but for sure we've got three in the top 47. The odds of three things happening at one in 100 or one in a million. One in 100 to the third power, that's one in a million. Mm -hmm. So this is not, that's not a random event, in other words. These banks are big. And the reason they went down is 
when the Fed goes on a $4.5 trillion asset buying spree, it's not going through Mayberry Bank, where Sheriff Andy and Opie in Mayberry are, are banking, and the bank's got $100 million in assets. You got to go through larger institutions. And they also went through two big to fail banks. But the two big to fail banks, as you and I both really have known for 15 years, they're above the law, they're protected, they're fine. Um, it's really the next layer of banks down, which are big enough so we can move four and a half trillion dollars of assets on to, into household accounts, but they're but they're small enough that we can still kind of push them around. Those that was that was the target to me, um, and you could see in the data that, that you can track. One of the things you can track online, and I show in the video, is what percentage of accounts at a given bank, what percentage of its money on deposit is sitting in accounts north of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And those three banks that failed, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and First Republic, are one, two, and three in terms of the percentage among the top 34 banks. So it's it's the rich banks. That's what makes this crisis so twisted. It's like, well, explain, this, explain to me how you have a banking crisis where the only banks that are failing are your richest banks. It's rich people's banks that are failing. What's yeah. up? And what's up is, well, the Fed had to buy assets from a bunch of rich people who had treasuries and mortgage-backed securities or their companies that then transfer the money to them. That's the story. And nobody's covering it, of course. They're all yammering on about interest rate and maturity mismatches. I covered maturity mismatches. That's a problem, but it's, it's a solvency problem. It's not a liquidity problem, right? And so nobody is really talking about the whales in the pond and the fact that the Fed went on this asset buying spree from non-banks and the fact that it jacked up the retail bank supply, bank money supply by four and a half trillion dollars on, on a 13 and a half trillion dollar base. Nobody's mentioning that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of having a conversation. Um, I think it was yesterday about the the concentration of wealth. Let's say, for example, the, the concentration of just as kind of a parallel here, the concentration of um, stocks that are actually holding up the Nasdaq as you know, it's its best start to the year in in I, I think it was ever. Um, it seems to be you know just a handful: Apple, Nvidia, um, yep. uh, wh whoever else. The, Mi these Microsoft, yeah, Microsoft, Beta, Google, you know those. Yeah, it, it, it really it really seems like a like a dangerous time where you know you only have these these handful of very concentrated, very um, valuable stocks and or accounts, as, as you're saying. Um, and it seems to create this explosive situation. Yeah, that, that's a great that's a great observation. That it's, the, the, who's really propping up the stock market? Mm -hmm. It's really those five companies starting with NVIDIA. They're all knee deep in AI. You know, I don't know if that's a connection or not, but that's a good place to start. Like, why is why? How is it that these companies are propped up and other tech companies maybe aren't? It's only really the big the, the big ones. But it's just it's the hyper concentration and the hyper wealth concentration that's really really wagging the dog here. It's, you know, Main Street is sort of out of the out of the out of the picture now. It's just disregarded altogether. Its businesses are shut down while the whale businesses are promoted. You know, this is just in a lot of ways what you're seeing in the bank crisis and in the Nasdaq both are simply a continuation of of the game of favoritism we saw that started in the pandemic. Where the big box stores get to stay open, but you know, oh no, we can't have the corner bar can't stay open. That's dangerous. Yeah. You know, it's only Walmart that gets to stay open. You know, it's a complete. It's picking winners and losers. That's what's going on, and that's been that's been the really the driver of my channel. Yeah, I cover a lot of finance and money creation and stuff, but the thing that really got me going was the, it's, it's the absence of the rule of law. It's like there's no more level playing field. You know, you, there's all you have instead is bailouts. You know, you get a, you get a result. The powers that be get a result they don't like under the system of rules. And what do they do? They just jettison the rules. They scotch the rules and they just pick winners and losers and they move forward that way. And this game has gone into hyperdrive or overdrive with this banking crisis and in the stock market as well. You're exactly right about that. You know, John, we also saw Credit Suisse at that time blow up as well. Does this, you know, show us the interconnectedness of the banking system in the West or the, let's say, the vulnerability of the assets that they were holding? I don't really, I don't really know what went on with Credit Suisse, except to, you know, to the extent that, you know, Credit Suisse and UBS combined, that's, that's a big bank because both of those banks 
If you go back to 2010 or 2011, whenever it was that the Bank for International Settlements or really the Financial Stability Board within the Bank for, Bank for International Settlements came out with that list of global systemically important banks, GSIBs, both Credit Suisse and, on, and US, UBS are on that list in Switzerland and now they're combined. That's a, that's a big bank. What drove that in particular? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to rely on the opinions of other people and I don't like to do that. I've, I've gotten away from that. And that's really my channel is I'm not, I, I just forget, I, I can't rely on other people. I'm gonna go to original documents and original sources and draw my conclusions that way. And I simply haven't looked at the original documents. For one thing, I don't know how to get to Swiss banking documents, European banking documents. I know how to get to the ones in the US. And that's really where my focus lies. So I'm not, I don't really have an opinion mm -hmm. other than what I've just told you on what happened with Credit Suisse. I, I'm just out of my depth there. So is the path forward if we get more bank failures here? Is it possible that we we have you know bank bail-ins, or is this too just too um politically unpalatable? Well, anybody, you know, it's anybody's guess, Tom, because like I say, the rules are off. You know, they just make up the rules as they go. There was a rule about insuring people, insuring accounts north of $250,000, right? The accounts north of $250,000 were uninsured. Well, it turns out they were insured. If you were the right person, if you were from China, maybe they were. And if you were from somewhere else, maybe they weren't. If you're from the Bahamas, they just make up the rules as they go. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just Janet Yellen and Jay Powell and Gary Gensler and the gang. They sit down in a room, okay? And they decide in secret, well, this this is a systemically important institution, and this one isn't. Note, though, that when they do these things, they're just they're picking winners and losers, and there's no record of what they did. There's no court reporter. There's no stenographer. There's no videographer in any of these rooms. It's just a dark room, opaque to the public, where these guys are picking their crony friends to, and, and bailing them out and saying to hell with Main Street. Mm -hmm. So you know, your question is, what's going to happen going forward? With, will there be bail-ins? Yeah, here. Yeah, if it suits their purposes, there will. And if it doesn't, there won't. It doesn't really matter what the rules are, because in the end, to get the result they want, they're going to sit in a the room, they're going to label it systemically important conversation, and they're going to do what they want. We're, we live in a lawless nation run by criminals. John, what are some ways that, let's say, individuals can assess the risk going forward of their of their own bank? Well, I, I walked through two red flag tests in my video, the Killer Whales video. One way is to look at your bank's federal home loan board borrowing and see if it's spiked up and look at how much how much does your bank owe the federal home loan board and how much of the bank's equity does that amount represent? Because all three of the banks that failed, that amount was north of 75%. So if your bank is in with spitting distance of that, let's say it's over half, I mean, I would get out yesterday. But the real test as I show in that video, is the percentage of deposits at your bank that are north of $250,000. If that number is high, and, and I think the smallest of the of the big three that failed, I think the smallest amount of uh, that percentage was around 89%. It's a massive number. The vast majority of deposits of those banks that failed, the vast majority of those deposits were north of $250,000. So if you're banking at a rich bank, you need to, you need to Realize we live in upside down world. Go bank at a go bank at a credit union, or a community bank, or something way smaller, way more, way less sexy than a big bank. Don't don't be seduced by the hype of oh yeah you want to be with a rich and famous. You absolutely do not want to be with a rich and famous. They're going to be the first ones to get rolled over, and you're seeing that right now. Mm -hmm. Rich and famous and not connected. That's right. not where you want to be. I mean th that would let's say, protect you from that particular risk. But do you, you know, going back to that idea of duration mismatch or, or yeah. you know, is, is there a way to, that you have looked at that, that highlights that risk as well? Not really. I mean, but if you're talking about how to protect your money, I mean, you have to be insane out of your mind at this point, not to, not to be, have some holdings of precious metals. I mean, that, that's just, that's just stood the test of time. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what your monetary theory is or anything. Those things have been around for 5,000 years for a reason. Okay. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of silver. Um, I mean, I wouldn't put all my eggs in any one basket, but, but for sure, 
I leave it in those because, you know, my, my old man told me a long time ago, he says, well, the silver quarter will always buy you a gallon of gas and then a gold coin and that one ounce gold coin will always buy a really good men's suit. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a, what a crazy thing to say, but you know, it turns out I was the crazy one. The old man was right about that. Right. Those things sort of, you know, those are, those are, those are assets that sort of sit on top of an, a very volatile ocean, just sort of floating. And if inflation goes up, they go up. If there's bad time, they're going to go down, but they're not going to go away the way the Silicon Valley bank does, where one day it's there. And then six hours later, the bank goes, goes poof. And it's a rich bank. You know, if you believe the hype, you'd say, well, that bank is fine. It vanished overnight. Do you, do you have any opinion on, on holding any type of, of cryptocurrency to, you know, protect against some type of situation like that? Some people are convinced by I, I, I Tom. I mean, I, I, I don't understand it, um, so I don't hold it. You know, I don't. I, I just don't get it. It's I, I just don't understand it. No one has ever presented a case to me, a short case that I can understand of like why would I part with money that I worked for and I spent my time and labor to get to hold something that I don't understand. Gold and silver, I get. Okay, it's five thousand years. The silver quarter buys a gallon of gas forever. Okay, that I understand. That's the kind of thing that a literal minded guy like me could get my head around an algo and, you know, open ledger. And all that stuff. I, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand the case for it, but I'll tell you this, a, a guy that I converse with regularly on, on banks and who really knows his banks, the guy I, I cite on the channel, uh, Josh, Joshua Marie wrote a book called debt by design. He's a, he's strong into crypto and he said, you got to You got to get in. So I'll tell you, there, there's some smart people, who are into crypto and they're into it big time. I'm just not that smart. I'm not smart enough to get into it, I guess. Mm-hmm. So John, do you think it's possible that this is the start to a road of eliminating commercial banks and thereby making it easier for the implementation of what you called a, a one tiered banking system or a CBDC? Yeah, it could very well be. It's certainly the start. Well, I, I don't think you can seriously argue it's not the start of a the consolidation. Uh, of, of the banking system, the two tiered system, like you say, you have two issuers of money, the Fed is issuing money, it issues cash, Federal Reserve notes, and it issues reserve or really reserve deposits to commercial banks. And that's the two forms of money. And then the next tier down is the commercial banks, which issue retail bank deposits, you know, that money gets lent into existence. The one tier system would be the Fed doing everything. The problem, though, with the one tier system is the Fed, you know, it's 12, it's, you talk about a regional banking system. The Fed system, when you get down to it, is a regional banking system. Silicon Valley Bank banked at the San Francisco Federal Reserve. Those 12 districts, though, those 12 banks, the big one being the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, obviously, they don't have the bandwidth to manage, you know, 13 and a half or $18 trillion of retail bank accounts. They're going to need uh, another layer. They're going to need another layer of, of, of institutions, they may not be issuing money like commercial banks do, but they're going to be managing accounts like commercial banks do for damn sure. And so I, but I think though, to do that, you can't have a system with 4,700 banks. That's, that's not manageable. And so I think what we're seeing is the consolidation of these banks into a much um, tighter group where the JP Morgans of the world, you know, JP Morgans a 3.2 trillion dollar asset bank. That's that's the biggest bank in the US by far. Um, and it's getting bigger. It, it got bigger as a, as a result of these bank failures taking on those depositors who are now, you know, homeless, temporarily homeless. A lot of them ended up at JP Morgan and the like. But I think I think we're seeing a consolidation underway. What's going to happen with the other, you know, 4,000 odd banks? That's anybody's guess. I think though, if you think this crisis is over, um, you know, I would urge you to go back and review what happened in 2008 and the timing there where Bear Stearns goes down in, in March and Lehman Brothers goes down in September. You know, we're, we weren't out of the woods when Bear Stearns went down, you know, when Fannie and Freddie started acting up in the summer and we're not out of the woods now. So I don't know what happens in the future, but we are in we're not in good times right now. We're, we're there's, there's a lot of rocks and a lot of hard places and a lot of squeezing going on right now mm-hmm. well you know to that point seeing the fastest rate hiking and schedule schedule in history here being at at five and a quarter percent it seems like there 
are a lot of vulnerabilities in in these systems that are you know going to um be shown by that type of rate hike is, is i agree is, i mean i fair? look at that and i think yeah yeah it's i it's a very dangerous thing to to increase rates that quickly uh, for one the volatility alone is a problem but another problem i think about is well if i'm a bank like say let's i'm going to use an example bank of america um is headquartered in charlotte north carolina if 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 i'm bank of america and the fed is paying me on my reserves and i've got a you know a bunch of reserves and the fed's paying me to park my money at the bank and I can get five and a quarter percent at the Fed, why would I, why would I lend money out? Why would I, why would I create new deposits and create loan papers that pay, you know, whatever, 8%, 10% when that's risky, that business may fail. And I'm guaranteed to get five and a quarter percent from the Fed. Mm-hmm. You know, that's going to, that's going to put a crimp in lending. And in fact, if you look at the, if you go back to Fred and look at the top 25 lenders, and this has been a trend for a long time, the top 24 banks, top 25 banks, they're not good lenders. You know, their, their lending has gone down over time. It's really the smaller banks that are lending out than mid-sized banks. Mm-hmm. They're, they're the ones that are completely getting unfairly maligned in this, in this so-called crisis, like this regional banking crisis. I mean, re, let's be honest. They chose the regional banking crisis. They've chosen that label because that, that, that conjures up images of small local banks when that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the next run down. Mm-hmm. So those banks, the, the, actually the well-run banks are the, are the small and mid-sized, but not all of them. There's some dogs among them to be sure, but the best run banks are in that, in that lower tier. They're in their mid-sized and smaller banks. Mm-hmm. And they're being, they're being thrown and, and sort of implicitly maligned by the label regional banking crisis. It's not a regional banking crisis. It's a targeted banking crisis. And the target is the band of banks immediately below the two big to fails. It's the banks ranking from seven to 34. Those are the banks that you should be worried about. Right. So, you know, on the other side of that, John, again, with the with the F- Fed hiking interest rates to five and a quarter here, many say that the rate hikes make the federal debt unsustainable or unmanageable. Does that start to be an issue all at once? The instant interest rates are are raised to that level or is it only when the debt has to be rolled over what what's the nuance there well it's just what you said i mean if you could you can increase the the rates overnight let's say the fed went from zero percent to five and a quarter percent overnight that's not that's not immediately a problem immediately it's no problem at all because nothing's coming due it's it's only it's only newly issued debt that's affected so over time if that five and a quarter that that new rate sticks all new debt under that that those payments are going up. Mm-hmm. And the other thing you mentioned is old debt. It's, it's rolling over. So you got 10 year debt, the 10 years is coming due. You got to roll over that debt. You got to you re up. You're not re upping at 0%. You're re upping at the new rate mm-hmm. and you can tack that on to the interest payment too. And that's a major problem because eventually you, you, you risk running a point to you risk hitting a point where you're borrowing money to make your interest payment. And that's ball game. You know, and I, I did a video about this called um, "Your Federal Reserve RX, you know, Cancer RX is Ready for Pickup," and I walked through the composition of the of the U.S. debt. And one of the things in there is the interest on the debt. And I did that video basically when interest rates were damn near zero, and it's still kind of a big chunk of the sort of what I call the mandatory payments on debt. That's going to be a real issue when you're bo- when you borrow your money. Think about think about your mortgage. Okay. I don't know anything about your mortgage, but I know this. Your mortgage payment is bigger by a little bit than your interest payment on your debt. It has to be. Because if it isn't, it means you're not whittling down principal. And if it isn't, it means your interest payment and your principal payment are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's going to be an exponential series that's going to blow up in your face. And that's where the U.S. is. The U.S. is reaching a point where the interest payment on the debt is bigger than its mortgage payment, meaning it's bigger than its tax revenue. And when that happens, when you hit that point, watch out, watch out, man, because the creditors, the, the, the rating agencies are going to be like, wait a minute, your, your interest payment is bigger than your than your tax base. You're borrowing money to pay, you know, to pay the VIG. You're borrowing money to pay the juice. That's when your hands get broken. That's when your kneecaps. That you're in, you're in real trouble. When yep. you get to that point, and the U.S. is at that point, 
they're they're playing with fire these guys mm-hmm. it was kind of interesting you know i'm i'm from canada john and uh i was doing some research uh yesterday just about about the the housing market in canada and of course with interest rates going up um some of these variable rate mortgages they've changed the rules on so instead oh. of instead of needing to to refinance they simply extended the length of a lot of these mortgages and so there's one of the examples i saw instead of being a, a 25 year mortgage that mortgage has now been extended to 72 years and the actual <laughs> um cost of the mortgage has tripled yeah and that's you know th- that's before obviously before the shit has really hit the fan right and seeing yeah. that type of rule change as as you were saying just does not fill me with confidence no it doesn't and number one number two what happens when you try to sell that debt you know eventually you you know this debt is an asset to somebody mm-hmm. you know that somebody gets in trouble and they try to sell they try to sell a note that you just bump from 25 years to 72 years or whatever it is in other words your stream of payments is a lot less that's the whole point of that is you're trying to you're trying to help the liquidity problem but you're you're exacerbating the solvency problem so when that person tries to sell, they're going to go from taking a loss to taking a bloodbath. Yeah. So games like that are only going to work, and a lot of times, you know, they make things way worse. Especially they make it they make it worse for the other reason you mentioned, which is you lose confidence in the system. And a lot of people are losing confidence in the system. You know, I talk to a lot of normal people, and even they are like, "What is going on?" I mean, these rule changes, and it's just it's just the system is designed to enrich people who are connected and only people who are connected and everybody sees that now. Mm -hmm. Not everybody, but more and more people are seeing it. Right. So, you know, we've now seen the fed pause on this rate hiking schedule while publicly stating that there might be two more small hikes likely by the end of the year. So do you see this as the start of the pivot? And again, do you think it's possible that we get more banking issues after the summer, similar to what we saw in 2008. I think you're guaranteed to get more issues as you move on. And I think you're guaranteed to get lower um, lower interest rates. It's just a matter of when, because the Fed knows damn well. The, the Treasury is the one that comes out with the annual report saying, hey, you know, the debt's out of control. It, it, the, Powell himself, two years ago, admitted in an interview that the debt was the fiscal path of the U.S. was unsustainable. They They know these issues. They know... They know the interest payment is getting out of control, and they know that if you got to remember, the Fed itself is on record saying, "Well, the FOMC statements, these statements, we come out in the minutes, the, the minutes being the summary that's generated, you know, in real time, not 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 the transcript. The transcripts don't come out until five years later, but the minutes they're generated contemporaneously with the conference or whatever." The Fed has said, "You know, we really this is really a perception management tool." We do these things to sort of manage expectations and manage their perception. And that's what the Fed, that's what its business is. It's, its business is to manage public perception on the one hand and to benefit its private owners on the other hand. And as long as you remember that, you know, the Fed, the Fed's, you know, it's in the long term, it's predictable what it's going to do. And I'm telling you, it's going to have to lower rates because of the interest rate problem you mentioned or the, or the payment on the, on the debt. Is going to be too big if you leave these rates too high for too long. It's going to it's going to kill you. Yeah, frankly. So they're going I mean, to bring rates down eventually. The question is, what's going to be the triggering event? What cover story are they going to need to cut rates to zero? Yeah, I think I think the the bigger point there is that you know there's there's only two ways out of this. It's either defaulting, which isn't palatable, or inflating you know that debt away. And obviously, that makes a a far worse situation for the the middle class and anybody with any actual debt on their on their household balance sheet. Yeah, the, the track record when sovereigns get into trouble. First of all, a sovereign government borrowing its own currency is absolutely ins- insane and absurd. I'm going to leave that fight for another day. But if you're borrowing your currency into existence, as most sovereign countries do, because they turn it over to the private you know central banks. Now, when you do that, you're going to get into trouble. And when they do get into trouble, the track record is quite clear. They try to inflate their way out. And I don't see any reason to think they're going to, we're going to have a different outcome here. 
So, you know, John, to let's say to contrast what is happening in the US, and I think the the West in general, we've seen an insane amount of of gold buying by many Eastern countries, of stockpiling gold over the last year, stockpiling assets. Do you yeah. see, do you have any, you know, type of explanation for why they, why those block of countries would be doing that? I, I don't, I have speculation, not, not so much an explanation. I don't, mm-hmm. but I can, I can just remind you that, you know, the U S was on the gold standard for a long time. Um, you know, gold redeemability, at least by, you know, other foreign governments up, up through August 15th, 1971. And then you know, Nixon shuts the gold window and we float there for a couple of years. And the way to the way that you sort of stemmed um, whatever problem that was and whatever problems that was created, it went to the petrodollar, meaning, you know, we'll offer you, you know, Gulf states protection, you know, for your oil as long as you conduct your oil transactions in U.S. dollars. So it sort of artificially created demand for the dollars. The res- but the point is, it's a resource-based game. Now, if you look at the BRICS and look at these other nations, you know, 60% of the U.S., 60% of the world debt and 60% of really world assets are denominated in U.S. dollars. So the Chinese yuan or whatever else, it's, it's, it's a long way, decades off from, from being even a candidate for war reserve currency status. However, everybody needs resources. And what I see going on with these other countries is, you know, they're doing, they're making a lot of moves to consolidate resources among themselves and keeping those resources away from, you know, Uncle Sam in the U.S. and the West. And, I, they're, they're, you know, to me, gold is part and parcel of a bigger resource picture and the consolidation of resources among nations that are sick and tired of the U.S. borrowing its money into existence and trying to export its inflation abroad. And so I think that, that that's really my read on the consolidation of gold. It would not surprise me at all for these nations to get together and sort of offer their own gold-backed or resource-backed currency. It wouldn't surprise me a bit. Mm-hmm. And if that happens, then probably you know, the, the acceleration away from the dollar the U.S. dollar to, you know, that another currency would would pick up steam. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you I know, sixty percent that's a that's a big number, and that's what gives the U.S. really its power. That and its military, but its military is coming into question now. So that's another thing to keep your eye on. Yeah, I think again that just that just creates more more spending and more more liabilities, right, for for the federal government. It does. Um, and, and the question is why? Because if your military can't, you know, if it's no longer the big guy in the block, you know, you, you, yeah, you, 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 U.S. has proved its ability at beating dudes in sandals with no weapons. But really, when was the last time the U.S. faced a peer adversary? Not really, not until now. And it's not going well. You know, well, so true. if your military, yeah, 1973, that made sense. There was nobody else to challenge it to the U.S. It, it could be, its muscle could get behind those those oil contracts. Now, not so much. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a much tougher it's a much tougher road. Well, John, I appreciate you uh, explaining to us a little bit about your understanding about the the banking crisis and and the the debt problem. Um, of course, your channel, best evidence on YouTube, great resource, and your your Substack as well, where you. As, as you say, take a, a real sniper shot at some of these uh, these subjects here. Anything yeah, else I don't. To... I don't... Go ahead. Yeah, I've, I've you know I've been I've been doing these videos nine years. I've made a total of thirty four videos. They're really more like documentaries. I put a lot of research in uh, time into them, and I really put a lot of time into writing them and making and trying to present them um, in, in a narrative that you know ordinary people can understand if they're willing to take the time out and kind of watch my stuff. And they're reasonably intelligent. They're, you know, I try to make difficult and arcane subjects understandable to the intelligent layperson. That's really my goal in that channel. Mm-hmm. And and a little bit entertaining, even. A little bit. I, you know, I, that's mostly for me. I get bored. Yeah, absolutely. You got to keep it real. Excellent, John. Do you have anything else to to add before we wrap up here? No, no. I'm glad. I'm glad you uh, invited me on your show. Thank you very much. It was good. To, good to talk to you, Tom. Excellent to to have you, John. And, um, you know, I look forward to your to your next video here. 
Great, thanks. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.